Good morning, my name is Aneda Rodriguez, the Executive Director for the Regional Alliance for Small Contractors and the Chair of the Competitive Edge Committee. And if I have our committee members in the room, can you please stand, all committee members? Thank you so much. I think some of our committee members may be missing from last night, I don't know. <laughs> But again, good morning and thank you for being here today. Um, we've got a very robust program for you today full of uh, quite a bit of information, um, procurement opportunities, a lot of networking, um, top procurement opportunities, those that are coming into the transportation infrastructure. So I do hope that you stick around for the day and uh, take advantage and ask questions and get the information that you need so that you can continue to further your business because that's what the goal of the Competitive Edge Conference is, to create and help you understand the best practices that our agencies are, are looking and um, putting initiatives out there on all of these major projects that are through New York City, New York State, um, so that you can take advantage. It's a balance. Um, our agencies, and I say our agencies because I was at MTA for over 20 years and it's hard to get it out of my skin, although I'm the executive director for Regional Alliance, it kind of works out for me um, knowing the culture of the organizations and the fact that now with the nonprofit organization that I'm running, um, Regional Alliance will be built to assist small businesses and agencies to help you further your goals in, in all areas. So I, I welcome you on behalf of the Competitive Edge Committee, on behalf of Regional Alliance for Small Contractors, and we're gonna take that small out at some point. It's gonna be Regional Alliance for Contractors. And uh, yes, yes. And, but we can't do it without the grace of God. So right now, Michael Blake will come up and give us our invocation. What up, though? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. We, we try to have fun when we do these things, if that's all right. Uh, and before we, we go into the word, can we just put our hands together for Zenaida for all she's doing right now? Come on now. Come on, we can do better than that. We can do better than that. We always got to show love to our sisters that are leading. Uh, and, and to be in these spaces, let's be honest, for a woman of color to be leading in these spaces that typically, you, you, you know, I love the white guys, but the white guys too often are trying to tell black and brown people what to do in these spaces. Um, so it's critical that we empower those that are here. And, and to Cam, I'm not sure where Cam is at, but thank you for the invitation as well, uh, for always being a blessing to me. Uh, and last but not least, I'm not just uh, preaching it and praying it, I speak it as well, because I'm an MWB certified as well. My company's been in existence for 10 years. Uh, next level that you've seen the book where the only black owned sports TV network. So we're not just here in theory, we're here in practice. Amen. So, shall we turn our hearts and minds to the throne? You can bow your heads and close your eyes and however you reflect at this time. Dear creator of all things, no matter if we call you God for the great words of the Torah, or maybe we powerfully call you Allah for the guidance from the Quran, maybe it's the great and grand architect of the universe to encompass all, or if we call you Jesus for the New Testament as a foundation, no matter what we call you, we start by saying thank you. Thank you and good morning for us having this day. Despite how life can take us to the edge, you woke us up and lifted us to a hopeful eternity. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division of soul and spirit. So remember these words when you are tested as business owners, when people try to take you to the brink and take you to the edge, when a prime contractor doesn't want to pay you on time, pull me back from the edge. When you're asked to submit more reports than your much other light-skinned counterparts, pull me back from the edge. When you are told that you are appreciated but your proposal costs too much money, pull me back from the edge. I think someone understands what I'm saying right now. When you learn that you should have won the bid but you lost to a supposedly woman-owned business, pull me back 
from the edge. When you win the bid, but then you're told about bonding that you weren't told about before, pull me back from the edge. But we come here on this day of 718 that obviously equals 25 to say give us the competitive edge so we have the capacity energy finance connection as a network to give me that hour of 25 that is greater than normal 24. Remember that you serve a creator regardless of the name who is sharper than any two-edged sword meaning that you have a competitive edge because you have a creator of the eternity. They may try to ban books but they shall ban their nonsense. They may want to say there's no affirmative action but you must affirmatively declare that you are black and brown. They may not want to provide your student loans, but you will provide capital, capitalism and consciousness to the masses. They want to block your bid, but they cannot block your blessing. They want to deny DEI, but you shall mobilize MWBE because you serve a creator who gives you the competitive edge. So on this day, be ready to leap from the edge to higher heights. On this day, be ready to leap from the edge from sub to prime. On this day, be ready to leap from the edge of being considered small to owning the whole thing. On this day, leap from the edge because you have the competitive edge known as God. So in the name of the Father who created the competitive edge known as the sun, moon, and the stars. In the name of the Son who with his competitive edge, when they thought they won on a Friday was victorious on a Sunday and in the name of the Holy Spirit who gives you a competitive edge so that you are more valuable than any contract, more qualified than any questionable source and you can remix MWBE to mean the most winningest business ever. I am ready to leap from the edge and declare victory is mine, victory is mine, victory today is mine. I told these haters, get thee behind because victory today is mine. We say Ashe. Get those chills. <laughs> Someone's talking. Um, okay, so we're going to uh, start the program. We're running a little late, but it's going to be very informational here. Um, I'd like to bring up the moderator, uh, Kim Hardy. She is the Senior Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion, and Compliance for McKissick and McKissick. Um, Kim, Kim has uh, so much experience on her. Most importantly, she is currently the, a member of the executive team for McKissick & McKissick, um, which has some very, very high level projects throughout New York State, um, one specifically being the New York, the new Terminal One $9.5 billion development project at John F. Kennedy International Airport. I've asked Jim, I, I've asked Kim, I'm sorry, to turn this around to, um, a discussion on bridging the gap, equity to equality, and making it more a DEI conversation with the high-level executives that are here today. So Kim, I'd like to welcome you up. And uh, I know that this is gonna be an intense discussion. Um, we are gonna leave um, time for questions and answers that's very important. Uh, we will have some cards going around with some volunteers, that will happen soon. And we will take questions at the end of the conversation. Kim Hardy. Thank you, good morning everyone. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Zuneda for that introduction and for leading the effort for us to gather, not only today, but last night, and we wanna acknowledge and congratulate all of last night's honorees. Uh, you know, how about another round of applause for Minister Mike Blake? Everybody's ready to take the leap. We're gonna talk about bridging the gap, equity to equality, and we have an amazing panel for you. It's nice to see so many friends in the audience. So I'm going to ask our panelists to come to the stage and then we will introduce them. If you open the journal on page 36, you will see all of our great panelists. Thank you so much.
we're going to start with our introductions. It's, it's a great pleasure to, to have met uh, Jamie Torres Springer, who is the president of the MTA uh, Construction and Development. He's also the MTA's chief development officer. He's managing a budget over $55 billion, and there will be a lot more of that in the, in the future. Uh, so he also, some of you probably will recall, he was the commissioner of New York City's DDC. Not only that, he's led a national urban planning practice. So he really understands how we can build opportunities for our diverse businesses, and it's such a pleasure to have him join us. Please welcome him. Next to him, we have Eric Alamany. <clears throat> Eric, I know a lot of you know Eric because I see every time I go to a conference, I see Eric. We've sat on a number of panels together. Eric is Senior Director of Supplier Relationships for the New York Power Authority. The Power Authority has billions and billions of dollars, and I'm sure many of you have worked with Eric. He's an engineer. Uh, by training and has stepped into the diversity uh, role and is doing amazing things at the New York Power Authority. He has been there over 25 years, folks. So please uh, welcome Eric. <laughs> Next to Eric, we have Kareen Apollon, who's the Chief Diversity Officer for New York City Public Schools. Kareen reminded me that she's only been in the role for about 18 months. It seems like a lot longer because she has done such amazing work to help push our diverse firms forward. Oh. Mic <laughs> <Mike> drop. <laughs> and, and Kareen comes to uh, DOE from a really interesting background, she was an executive at Scholastic, and I'm sure many of you know Scholastic. You know, they provide so many books and education. So her background is particularly interesting, uh, and she led a lot of community engagement work there and really focused on empowering marginalized communities. So it's so great to have her at DOE, and thank you for joining us this morning. <laughs> and as they say, last but not least, we have Michael Gardner, who is New York City's first and now only uh, Chief Business Diversity Officer, running the Mayor's Office of MWBEs, but really uh, bridging the gap between New York City and New York State. Uh, I know everybody in this room knows Mike because he's been such a leader for us in terms of helping diverse firms. He's, 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 he's worked magic. He talks about that we're in a magical moment and I'm sure he'll, he'll, he'll address that later, but he has really worked magic over several decades. New York Housing Authority, School Construction Authority, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, and now New York City. So he certainly was the right man at this time to help propel the Adams administration and all of us that are, live and work in New York City uh, to assist um, minority and women-owned business enterprises. So please give a warm welcome to Mike Gardner. And of course, last night, Mike was the recipient of the Diversity and Inclusion Award. So, so well deserved. So we wanna have a little fun today. We, you know, we've got a fabulous panel. We're gonna ask them questions that are all of interest and we wanna start off with talking about our theme. The theme, as you know, for the entire conference is bridging the gap equity to equality. 
Mike, we want to hear what that means to you. Let's start with you, and then the rest of our panelists are going to, everybody's going to tell us, what does that mean? Why are we here? Mike, you're going to lead us, though. So, Kim, thank you, and thank you for that award last night. Uh, but I have to say that there's a saying that says that superstar athletes win scoring titles, but teams win championships. So I've been blessed to have worked with a great, fantastic team at the MTA. Tracy has stepped in and, and has beat my numbers uh, overnight. So, um, a, great, a great team at the SCA where we shattered um, a lot of records, but bridging a gap in equity, let me get, give you a story. When I was a kid in Chicago, I was standing on a corner one night and this Lincoln, black Lincoln town car pulls up and a very elegant gentleman gets out the car. Now, I was about seven or eight, I didn't know who he was. Um, but it turns out that he was my congressman. And as I'm walking in here, Michael Blake, there's a picture of my former congressman. He was on a picture because he ran in the 1936 Olympics with Jesse Owens. And when Hitler turned his back, when they won the gold and the silver medal, so my former congressman, his name was Ralph Metcalf. And so I've always been blessed to have black Congress people in my life, Charlie Rango, uh, Harold Washington, et cetera. And so we've been doing this work for a long time of making sure that government not only awards contracts in a cost-effective manner, because this taxpayer's money is being spent, but in an inclusive manner. And when the diversity practices are not in the critical path, <clears throat> when you're outside of the critical path, you're a add-on. And so having the ability to work for two of the biggest builders in this country, one by the name of Milo Reverso, who recently became the president of Manhattan College a, a few weeks ago when he was president and CEO at the MTA, and then John Lieber, who, as you know, rebuilt the World Trade Center. So we figured out how to build capital construction projects. And Jamie came in and we did some great things in a year and a half. How you build your capital construction projects safely, timely, on budget, and inclusive of your MWBE goals. Because you know what happens sometimes, Jamie, is that when you put an aggressive schedule up, the for-profit contractors who are building your projects, they'll come to you with a game. And the game simply is this, Tracy. You know, if you want me to achieve your aggressive time schedule, then you need to relax the MWBE goals. The answer is no, we're not doing that. You know, so the expectation has to be when you're awarding contracts, that contracts need to be awarded, say, uh, uh, finished safely, timely, on budget, and inclusive of MWDBE goals. Equity, taxpayers' money, need to be um, appreciated by everyone in the marketplace and not just the larger contractors. And so we have done some very, very great amazing things mm -hmm. at the SCA and at the MTA. And I'll pause because I want to talk about the magical moment next. Great, Mike, thanks so much for that. <laughs> Kareem, we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna ask you the same question. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations, Mike, on your award. And um, you know, when I think about equity for us, we are a school system with over a million students of which 85% are BIPOC, 70% are black and brown children. And the economic engine that is New York City public schools is $37.5 billion, of which we spend approximately 10 to $12 billion annually, right? And so while we're talking about construction here primarily, so much of the work that's being done around facilities is happening at New York City Public Schools. SCA does all the construction, but the facilities maintenance and ongoing um, support is happening in New York City Public Schools. When we started, when this administration came in 18 months ago, there was less than 3% MNWBE vendors participating in that economic engine. Less than 0.02 and 0.03% for black and Hispanic firms, respectively. And so when you think about equity, it is what is required 
for us to build the necessary support systems, access and opportunities for MNWBEs to have access to participate and be competitive for all the solicitations that we do. We have over 3,000 contracts, right, that we're managing on an ongoing basis. And when you look at the solicitation methods and processes of the past, there are clear barriers that have been established by design, I might add, by design, because it's doing exactly what it was built to do. And so equity to me means how are we disrupting those systems that have been put in place? How are we ensuring that we're looking at every process, procedure, our rules, our policies, around procurement and solicitation, and how are we partnering with many agencies that have done this better in the past, right? We don't stand alone. This is a citywide effort, um, as Mike talked about, and why and the mayor and the chancellor are prioritizing this. So when I think about equity, it's the pieces that we know we must put in place to build the equity, because we'll never get to equality if we don't provide the equity systemic equity support information access that's necessary for MNWBs to truly have access and to truly be competitive. Kareen, thank you so much. Thank you so much for those thoughts. Eric, I have to just make a public service announcement before we hear from you. Folks, someone has a, a car, I'm not sure of the make and model, but it's New Jersey license plate H46 dash LES, we need you to uh, gather your car before it's towed, it's parked illegally. So please do that. That's the end of our public service announcement. <laughs> Back to our programming. Eric, 25 years at the Power Authority. I'm still blown away by that. Tell us, bridging the gap, equity to equality. Well, thank you, Kim. So I guess it's just maybe I'll start off with, you know, the defining equity and, and equality. So equality is treating everybody the same. Equity, you know, it's making sure that you're giving opportunities for uh, people to succeed, right? So um, I'm going to just start off with I'm a Latino from the Bronx. Boy, <laughs> I'm representing all the Bronx. Um, and so really, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a Christian family. You know, my, my grandfather was a preacher, really. And it was instilling about kind of um, making sure you're treating people with respect. You're supporting one another. You're helping other people succeed, lifting them up. And so really when, when we're thinking about kind of bridging that gap and trying to bring equity and equality together, it's really trying to help one another to, to grow. Um, we, we, are, we have the opportunity, we have the tool. So all of us here, and you're gonna hear, uh, we're, we're uniquely positioned to help others, help businesses, help you know, uh, across the state. So in terms of the power authority, we, largest state-owned electric utility in, in the country, we span from Niagara Falls all the way to Long Island. So we have a reach. We have an opportunity to kind of engage businesses here in New York, in New York City, you know, central New York, western New York, smaller communities, how do you engage businesses, others across the state to give everybody a shot, everyone an opportunity to compete? And so really it's, it's, it's when we're looking at how, how can we engage folks, you can't treat everybody the same way, but you do. We want to make sure we're, we're treating everyone with respect, giving everybody an opportunity, and that's where the Power Authority has been um, focused on to really reach out to communities, go to the communities where people are and say, listen, we're here, there's, there's work, how can we help you compete to gain opportunities that, that maybe you are not aware of? So it's spreading the message, making sure everyone gets the same message, and then helping them at the end of the day kind of grow their business so that that way they can be, um, you know, be competitive. So that's really helping. That, that's where I think their the opportunities is really just engaging communities where they are. Great. Th thanks for that, Eric. We look forward to hearing more about the tools 
the power authority is using a little later in our programming. Absolutely. And then Jamie, we're going to turn to you, sure. president, president of MTA Construction and Development. <laughs> Thank you. For, first of all, I, I just want to say it's, it's an honor to be in this room and amongst the people who are doing this work to advance the interests of these communities that historically have not had access to resources and to equitable treatment that leads to equality. Um, I'm in public service. One of the big reasons is to be an ally to the people that are doing this work and to support that. Um, so I'm, I'm honored that you're, you've included me on this. And I, I work closely with Tracy Mitchell, who's, uh, who's uh, serving as the acting chief diversity officer of the MTA um, and head of our Department of Diversity and Civil Rights. I know Tracy really should be up here, but he's on the panel uh, in a couple hours. So it's, we'll, we'll split the duty here. I, you know, and, and also, I, I'm sorry I missed the, it sounds like the real action was last night. So I, I'm sorry, sorry I missed the, uh, the awards last night. Um, you know, before we talk about contracting, I just have to say on this theme about bridging the gap, we just let's take a step back and think about what we're doing at the MTA to advance the regional transportation system. Um, a, a couple weeks ago, we launched the first bid package for the Second Avenue Subway Phase Two, which is going to extend Second Avenue Subway uh, through East Harlem from 96th Street, where the queue terminates now, up to 125th and Park, where it's going to connect to Metro North service. It's going to connect to the 4-5, uh, the Lexington line. That is a huge, huge contribution to regional equality. You know, 83%. Uh, of people use public transit in that neighborhood, 70% people of color. That's the kinds of projects that we're prioritizing at the MTA um, to promote equity and equality across the region. And the most important thing that everybody here can do, which is also in your self-interest, is to support us continuing to make investments in state of good repair, system improvement, and system expansion through our upcoming next capital program. You know, this capital program, $55 billion. Michael was a big part of creating it along with uh, my predecessor. Um, uh, you know, that's a five-year program. We're coming up on the next one, and we have to continue that level of investment. Otherwise, we're not going to keep our system in a state of good repair. We're not going to be able to make these investments. So we need your support as we go back you know, I know we've just been through a, an operating budget conversation with the state legislature. We got to go back for a capital budget conversation in the next year. And we need everyone here to be supportive of us continuing to make investments in the MTA. It's to everyone's benefit. In terms of contracting, there's lots to talk about. You know, the, Michael knows, and Tracy know the number better than me, but we're proud we did $816 million worth of payments to MWBE firms in the last fiscal year. $816 million, it's 37% of the entire state's MWBE payments. And that number is going to in continue to grow. Last year, we awarded over $11 billion worth of contracts overall. And so, you know, the payments are a lagging indicator. We're likely to continue to see the incline. But to Mike's point, it doesn't happen without hard work and advocacy. It doesn't just happen. We have to set the goals and stand by the goals when, uh, co you know, when uh, contractors come to us, non-minority contractors come to us and say, we can't meet those goals, we find a way to do it. And I will say, it becomes more complicated as time goes on because we're uh, resorting to alternative delivery models, design build, progressive design build. We did our first P3 contract award. Within each of those, it becomes a little bit more complicated and difficult to just use the same approach to ensuring that we've got MWB participation. But we're committed to doing it. And we have a team across our agency and across the MTA that makes sure that we are setting goals and requiring contractors to stick to them. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we're doing that coming up. But that's really the key to, to getting done what we're getting done. Oh, that's great. And Kim, yes, please, um, Mike. Jamie mentioned two key words here. He mentioned investment, right? So when we go to Albany or other places to get funding and investment, the same way that we invest in the region's infrastructure or the city's infrastructure, we must also invest in MWBE programming, right? right. Second, he talked about payments. Tracy knows the only thing that we are evaluating on is 
how many dollars were paid to minority-owned businesses. That's right. We are not evaluated on best faith efforts. That's right. We're ev evaluated on dollars. So for the MTA, under Jano's and Jamie's and, Ken and um, Tracy's leadership, to have 37% MWBE at North America's largest transportation network, that's just totally incredible. It's incredible. It's incredible, I agree, I agree. Yeah, I think it's particularly powerful for the audience that we have Jamie here who's on the business side and obviously we have diversity professionals like yourself, Mike, Kareen, Eric, um, here to talk about it, but you need support at the top of organizations for diversity to be successful. It's a team sport, as Michael said, but having an executive that understands diversity and the importance <coughs> is absolutely essential. And it's all well, about the numbers. It's well, about the dollars. Well, I appreciate that. But since we're complimenting each other across the way, having executive leadership in the mayor who has been smart enough to recognize that he needs a chief diversity officer Jeez. focused on these business issues um, is really key as well. Uh, as key, if not more key. And, and Mike's doing great things at the city, which we'll talk about. Well, we'll, we'll back, to, back to our uh, next question. And Mike, talking about uh, New York City, there has been uh, a lot of discussion about the, I'm gonna call it the, the inequity between the diversity, excuse me, the discretionary spending limits in New York City versus say at the MTA or uh, other state organizations. But we, we, we hear there's some good news there. Can you, can you give us the, the latest? What's happening with that? Right, so first of all, let me just say that Jamie is absolutely correct. Everybody is hiring chief diversity officers. Some people are just hiring one person and putting them out there as a showcase with no staff and resources, right? And so the four top characteristics of an effective MWDB program is this, that the person running the program must report to the top, the CEO, or the president. S second, that person has to have the adequate resources, a budget. The person has to have the adequate staff. And then fourth and final, the person needs to have the ability to be empowered to effectively do their job on a daily basis. Reporting to the top, executive support, board support. And I'll tell you, I, I was blessed to have at the MTA and at the SCA, a person who supported me, and that's Jim Harding, who was sitting in the back of the room. Stand up, Jim. Jim, Jim is also a product of the Gang of Four, those four individuals uh, walking across 135th Street, Charlie Rango, Basil Patterson, uh, Percy Sutton, and Congressman Charlie Rango. We're, we're all descendants or products of the Gang of Four. But you, you, you talk about and Jamie mentioned it, that we are in a magical time right now, a magical time. Eric Adams, Mary Adams, just, he doesn't just talk, he does. He appoints. Case in point, yesterday he appointed the first Puerto Rican NYPD commissioner in the history of the city of New York. Yesterday. He has assembled the most diverse administration in the history of the city of New York. The mere fact that I'm the first chief business diversity officer since 1624, I'm not sure if you were around when the city of New York was incorporated. I certainly wasn't. The first time in history, the most diverse administration of any mayor who has governed this city. And he has a simple mandate. And the mandate is this, by 2026, the city of New York, Michael Blake, will award $25 billion in contracts to minority women-owned businesses. And by the year 2030, that number will increase to 60 billion. And so not only are we restructuring, retooling, 
I'm, I'm having meetings with city council people right now because we're going to go to get some realignment issues. The mayor has indicated that he wants all of the chief diversity officers and their respective staffs not only reporting to their agency heads, in some cases that's not happening now, that you have people reporting elsewhere, but they must report to their agency heads and to me at City Hall, in addition to the ACOs reporting to um, their agency heads and also Lisa Flores and myself at City Hall. We're going to align this thing and we're going to empower these individuals and their respective agencies to do, to execute their daily duties and responsibilities through legislative action in the city council. Now you mentioned for the first time in history, Mayor Adams was able to get all of his MWBE legislation passed the previous session. I was in Albany 14 times and I wasn't going up there uh, enjoying the scenic view of the Hudson River or going to Albany on vacation. We were going up there working. So we have um, achieved, the mayor has achieved, creating, Jamie, the most largest construction mentoring program in the country. We are going to centralize a construction mentoring program, awarding contracts up to $5 million, uh, to firms who historically have only been able to work as subcontractors. That model is being taken from the SCA, the MTA, and now we change the state law to have a centralized New York City construction mentoring program. You can clap over that. <laughs> Second piece of legislation is dealing with um, affordable construction insurance. So we're going to implement an OSEP, Owners Controlled Insurance Program. Third is that we are, we've increased the City of New York's discretionary threshold from a million to 1.5 million. Fourth, e-bidding. And fifth, uh, MWBE reciprocity, certification, certification reciprocity, which means that if you're certified by the city now, you're going to be certified by the state and vice versa. And so this well, Mike, mayor... Mike, sorry, yes. can you just pause and repeat that last point again? <laughs> if you submit an application to SBS or ESD, your certification will allow you to be certified by both the city of New York and the state of New York. So the magical moment, the magical moment here is this mayor is about the people's work and the people's agenda, hiring competent staff to drive his vision and the MWBE program is empowered like never ever before and we're going to get some great things happening with your support and all we ask you to do is once the doors of opportunities are open at the 45 city agencies that you come in and you supplement what we want you to do and that's finish your contracts and assignments safely, timely, and on budget. All right. As someone who worked for New York City for over 20 years, that's remarkable progress that you've reported. Thank you so much for those efforts. Kareen, let's talk a little bit about what's going on at DOE. Obviously, uh, New York City uh, agency, um, but I know you're doing some exciting things as Chief Diversity Officer. Could you, could you share some sure, of Sure, I'm happy to share. Thank you. Toolbox? Sure. So as I mentioned, we're spending between 10 and $12 billion a year. And um, when we came in, there was less than 3% being uh, spent with MWBEs. We've seen in 18 months a 53% increase in spend, not just contracts or commitments, but actual utilization at over $500 million um, in just 16 months, 18 months of our tenure. How that's been able to happen is not by accident. It's been very intentional. As I said, we talk more about construction in this conference, but we are purchasing commodities. We are only second to the US military on the number of meals we provide throughout the year. That's 12 months of the year 
from September to June is the school year, and then June through September is summer school. We are spending um, over um, $250 million on food for children for lunch and after school. We are spending millions and millions and millions of dollars on commodities, toilet paper, paper towel. So I share that to say our industry reach goes wide and far. And so as we think about the mentorship programs that are happening with construction and construction services, we're looking to build a business development plan that allows us to provide the necessary technical assistance that's needed just around navigating the solicitation process, right? The work that we do in schools is a little bit different in that we have a huge percentage of our budget that's being spent directly in schools, right? Principals make the decision, district um, superintendents make the decisions. So when we think about our approach and looking at our uh, policies and procedures for procurement, when we make changes to those, we have to think about what's happening in central purchasing as well as what's happening at schools and districts. And so what we've been able to do is not only change the policies and procedures, but the implementation must be flawless. What does that mean? There's so much information that needs to go out to our, our vendors and our potential MWBE providers that we do monthly trainings, virtual trainings to inform our vendors. We have, uh, like I said, over 3,000 contracts, but most of our dollars spent within WBEs are on an uncontracted basis. And so we took the step to increase that opportunity because our goal is to build a business life cycle for our small businesses so that they can start with ease of entry in an uncontracted way. Our cap used to be $25,000. We're increasing that to $50,000 uncontracted in an uncompetitive way around simplified procurement. So now our small businesses can work with five schools and be able to have that relationship and provide services for approximately $250,000 if they're able to do it in a much greater way. That allows them the opportunity to start to build their business and prepare themselves to be a subcontractor. We just effectuated admin code 6129. In the past, we were not, um, didn't have to abide by that law because we were considered a non-mayoral. With this new administration, we went and um, adopted local law one, admin code 6129, that requires us to do 30% subcontracting on our contracts. Our, in, our agency goal is 30%, and it also allows us the ability to address the disparity within the disparity. As we know, there is disparity with MWBE, but then there's also disparity by race, and at the bottom of that is black, Hispanic, and Asian women. And so we're in, in, including the subcontracting goals, we're doing a goals program that addresses the disparity within the disparity. And so when you think about all the solicitations and the existing prime contractors, we now have to identify and flag internally and externally to say to our MWBEs, we are truly open for business and provide several different ways to access that business, whether it's through an uncontracted way, whether it's through subcontracting, as well as prime contract. And the MWB PCM is a huge opportunity for us. So we're looking forward to implementing the increase to 1.5 million, because there's so many opportunities and ways through commodities, through services, through facilities, that we can leverage MWBEs. And it takes away the long lead time for contracting, which is now at over 12 months. And so, as you can see, we're taking a multifaceted approach, um, addressing from bottom up and top down to ensure that there's access, there's opportunity, and there's competition to a diverse vendor pool that increases engagement with MWBEs. Kareem, thank you so much. Really, really happy that you, you focused in on uh, the services and, and, and suppliers beyond construction. Just with that in mind, I know time is getting short and we've, we've, we've got a few more questions for our panelists, but just by a show of hands, how many folks here are in construction? Professional services? Other suppliers? 
Okay, just to get a sense. Hey, Eric, we're gonna turn to you now and, 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 and love to hear you know, what you mentioned tools in your opening remarks. What are some of the, uh, the tools in the Power Authority's toolbox? No, thank you, Kim. So uh, I'll start off with this. New York Power Authority has a $2 billion annual budget. And part of that is really looking at how do we uh, create a sustainable future um, kind of moving forward. And so we actually have a 10-year a um, strategic plan that is looking at how we're going to invest in um, different areas to ensure that um, our assets continue moving forward. And so we, we actually are doing things like um, upgrading some of our renewable uh, hydro plants across the state, investing millions and billions of dollars into that space. Actually, about $1.5 billion is being invested in Western New York, another $1.5 billion in, in Northern New York. So just to, trying to give some, uh, some idea from, from that perspective. We're also uh, focusing on some of the large transmission lines, power lines in, in, um, across the state, trying to bring low-cost power down to where it's needed, here, down in, in, in New York City. And so we are investing to bring you bring power lines into New York State from that perspective. We're also working with some of our customers to help with energy improvements. So we talk about MTA, the city of New York, uh, public schools. They are New York Power Authority customers that we provide low-cost power to. We actually help them with their energy improvements in their facilities. So not only are they doing work uh, directly, but they're actually partnering with the Power Authority to help them with their infrastructure. So th that's another aspect that we're, we're, we're supporting. We're also uh, decarbonizing some of our fossil fuel plants. We're, if everybody knows, a couple of weeks ago, we had the uh, fires from uh, Canada. And so we were all impacted. So climate change is real. So from that perspective, how do we kind of help mitigate and invest into those areas? So we're actually investing a lot of money from, from that perspective. And then finally, I don't know if a lot of folks know, we actually um, took oversight of the New York State Canal Corporation. So that's 500 miles of waterways in the upstate New York that branches from east to west. How do we uh, promote tourism into those areas? So the reason why I'm kind of mentioning all this is because the Power Authority is seeking all types of services. We talked about construction. We talked about professional services. We're talking about IT technology, maintenance, MRO, you name it. So as an, as an organization, there is a fit for everyone in this room in, in terms of working with, with the Power Authority. We, we want to create an you know, eco space of, of, of opportunities for um, all suppliers. So we certainly want to partner. And, you know, I love, I love the, you know, the, the phrase, uh, we're open for business. Yes, the Power Authority is also open for business. So we are certainly looking to partner from that perspective. But I want to also kind of add a little bit more. So in addition to not just the fact that there's opportunities, we also have created um, business development programs to help businesses prepare for these opportunities, whether it is for the Power Authority, MTA, City of New York, uh, public schools. So part of that includes three different unique programs. One is um, a, a business capacity uh, program for small and local businesses. The second one is a surety bond uh, training program. And last night, one of the uh, awardees uh, that actually went through the, the program was a beneficiary of, of our surety bond program. They grew their, their business from zero bonding all the way to $5 million. So tremendous. l and congratulations uh, on that. And then finally, mentor protege program. We have a, a, a unique program on that end to partner um, prime contractors with, with smaller businesses to help kind of businesses grow. Uh, this last year, we were able to graduate about 150 um, diverse businesses all across New York State to support this work. So again, these are opportunities for businesses to work with the Power Authority. Great, thank you, Eric. Good to hear about the uh, mentorship programs, particularly. And then Jamie, let me, let me ask you from your perspective, you know, what do you think we can do to really ensure that we're maximizing opportunities, the MTA and perhaps other entities, maximizing opportunities for our diverse 
business. Sure. Uh, the, so, so the work goes on at the MTA. I, I will say, you know, when when uh, when Michael uh, mentions the, his, you know, his the city's legislative accomplishments, um, but uh, you know, you don't see too many people making 14 trips to Albany. Uh, who aren't, uh, uh, you know, in elected office and required to do so. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, but when, when Michael talks about that legislation the city passed, it's, it's all stuff that he either got passed or he was part of pioneering the implementation of at the MTA. So um, we have those same tools. The question for us is how we implement them. So within our broader MWBE contracting program, um, certification is the big challenge. We just don't think we have enough certified MWBE firms to be able to make the awards that we want to make. Um, so, uh, you know, part of that, this reciprocity will be a great tool. We have to figure out exactly how to implement that across the state and the city um, to make sure that there's opportunity. The rules are a little bit different, so there's some synchronizing that's required, um, but that's a great opportunity. Um, but you know, state certified MW, state MWB certification shouldn't be so hard. I think our colleagues at Empire State Development, uh, Hope Knight, who's uh, a great champion of MWB contracting, they have recognized that it's not easy enough to get certified by the state, and there's been a lot of work to accelerate that. We're very pleased we identified a set of priority MWB construction firms who uh, you know sort of submitted applications. We got 20 of them certified over the last few months with ESD working essentially in sort of a fast track to make sure that people can get certified. So if you're not certified as a state MWB and you've been frustrated by that process, resubmit now, because I think that this is now an opportunity to get people certified. We have that OSIP coverage. We've done a lot of work on insurance coverage at uh, MTA C and D recently. So that's an opportunity. And then we're very proud of our small business mentoring program. We've been hearing lots about small business mentoring. You know, over $600 million in contracting since Michael created it at the MTA. We're shooting for $78 million in, my, in uh, mentor, mentoring program contracting this year. And we're, but we're working within that program to try to make it work better. We're now, uh, uh, you know, we've increased the amount of mobilization payments that we're able to give. We've increased the amount of upfront financing, which is always a challenge for people to get moving. We also were very pleased. I don't know if we, the MTA was piggybacking on the city or city was piggybacking on MTA, it doesn't matter. We got uh, up to now $5 million in our, our upper tier. Um, so there's room for growth there. And also, just within the nitty gritty of administering that program, one of the things we recognize is we weren't addressing the disparity within the disparity enough. We weren't uh, awarding enough small business mentor program projects to black and Hispanic minority contractors. So now we balance that out. And basically, our alignment of awards is in line with the composition of the program. Now, I want to get more of those. Uh, and any of you that are here, I want to get more of those black and Hispanic minority firms into our program, and then we can balance out that composition even more. But we've made a lot of strides to balancing out composition. That's the, you know, that, the mentoring program is so important because the goal is for subs to become primes. And there's all that capacity building that's required. We're each talking about that. But that's our, our real, the way that we build capacity within minority firms so that they can prime bigger jobs is to start priming smaller jobs and build up that infrastructure and continue to work your way up the ladder. So w there's lots of opportunity at the MTA for that. So impressive. Thank you so much, Jamie, for, for that. So folks, you know, I, I, I'm getting the hook. We're gonna wrap up, but before we do, we're going to take a couple of questions. Before we do that, though, we just, Jamie, starting with you, we're going to ask you to leave our audience with one single word to remember the panel by. Well, I really like to you say equality word, or, uh, you know, but, but, <laughs> you know I, I, I guess it's just, it's just what? drive. You know, that, that's, right, that's what we're working on here. Write that down, drive, folks. Okay. Eric, how about you? Single word. Darn, really? Uh, <laughs> growth. Honestly, it's really, at the end of the day, it's, we're, we're here to help businesses grow. So I would say growth. Okay, drive, growth. Kareen? Engage. Engage. All right, Kareen. Follow directions, too. All right. <laughs> All right, Mike Gardner. Single word. Opportunity. All right, opportunity. Let's go. Let's hear it for our panel. 
Zineda, do we have time for two questions? We have time for one question. Okay, raise your hands. Young lady, please stand up, introduce yourself to this group, and give us your question. Great, thank you for that question. Mike, I'm gonna ask you to answer that for, on behalf of the panel. So if I can understand the question, you're asking how government is tracking, no? Um, ask it again, and ask, ask it again so I, I can understand your question. I got you. Okay. Got you at that. So, so we're, we're building a platform. We're building information technology that will allow us not only to effectively certify a company, but successfully integrate them into the, into the procurement opportunities. You can't certify a thousand companies. First of all, you cannot certify 1,000 companies. You need to be able to forecast where the opportunities are going to be in the next 12, 24 months. Then you create a marketing and outreach campaign to recruit those firms in those areas where the work is going to be. And then once they're certified, then you will effectively uh, integrate them into specific procurement opportunities. And so, like we, we are having a migrant conversation right now. The mayor has made it known. We have weekly calls. Those weekly calls are going to get more intense because the mayor has said that he does not want um, those black and Hispanic owned companies that we are targeting, he does not want those companies to be forwarded over for opportunities. He wants those companies to be forwarded over for contracts. Big difference between the two. Process is one thing, but contracts is another thing. And it needs to be focused and deliberate. And so we're having weekly calls, no, weekly meetings with the agencies who are buying supplies for the migrant opportunity that we have right now. Some people are calling it a migrant crisis, not a crisis. It's an opportunity to integrate these new citizens into our mainstream, but also benefit the companies that are selling products that look like the migrants. And so, as Kareen indicated, the mayor wants a priority with black and Hispanic owned businesses. We're dealing with the disparity within the disparity. So information technology, certification, effective integration. Thank you, Mike, that intersection with procurement and diversity. They're not separate silos. It's... Sir, if, can I just let the next panelist, she actually had a comment. I, I was just going to say, right, I think that's a very good question. And as Michael stated, we're working much more um, in, in concert. It's not just MWB programs and procurement. In, in New York City, the uh, chief procurement officer has a dotted line into my office making sure that we're working together. And we're going so far as to even look at our 
procurement processes to identify the, um, just the way it is written and that where the barriers may exist to, so we can take that away, unbundling contracts. So they're not ap happening, they're not mutually exclusive, right? We're working in concert with them and ensuring that the programs that we're building for MNWBE are, can be implemented through the procurement process, right? Because if it can't be implemented, then this is, not, this is happening um, for no good reason. It's, it's never gonna work, and so the implementation is essential, and we're working on an ongoing basis. You heard me talk about um, amending our procurement policies, our rules that we're governed by. That's, that starts at the procurement level, right? So you, it has to be done in tandem and in cooperation and collaboration. And let me say this, that's just as I'm, I'm gonna add on to, to Kareen. So there are mayor agencies and non-mayoral agencies, right? And the mayor, he has a tendency of texting one, two o'clock in the morning. And it's, a, it's, it's great, because I signed up for that. But the mayor even indicated, he says, listen, if we have procurement officials who don't want to change to where we are right now, we should think about replacing them. And so, so my case in point, I had, there's, there's one program there's one city and one program. So we have agencies who are under the mayor, and then we have the non-mayoral agencies. So I had someone, Jamie, who texted me, some, who sent me an email indicating that the mayor was encroaching upon their independence. So I, I, could, I couldn't believe what, what I was reading. <laughs> so I said, really? I said, okay. So I said, well, although technically speaking, it may not be a, a mayoral agency, but the mayor does have the ability to appoint your leadership and your board. I, I heard crickets, nothing, <laughs> nothing. So we're, we're gonna move forward in a way where it's one city, one MWBE program, 45 agencies, non-mayoral agencies, and mayoral agencies wrapped up into one. All right. Okay, folks, Mike, thank you. Thank you so much for that wrap up. I'm going a little rogue here. Sir, you're gonna have the final question, or you said comment. I hope it's a question, though. A gang of four. Gang of four, yeah. Yes. And, and, and I'll comment to that. Mayor, Mayor Adams indicated that he wants to leave a legacy like Harold Washington and Maynard Jackson. And so he wants to be the mayor who, he says, get stuff done. Get stuff done. Right, he doesn't mean, right, he doesn't mean stuff, but, but I'm not going to say the word, but, you know, so. The way you say it is ish. He wants to get ish done. <laughs> Great. Folks, can we please have a round of applause for this fantastic panel? Madam Chair, back to you. Thank you. <laughs> wow, what a great conversation. A round of applause to Kim Hardy for moderating this wonderful panel. And a loud applause to the great panel that we had this morning. I thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. Some, they, they started a conversation that you're gonna hear throughout the day at our different uh, procurement sessions. We're running a little late, but you know, information is important. So I'd like to have the closing remarks made by Dawn Sanders, who is here. She serves as Vice President and Deputy Director of MWBE Programs of the Division of Minority and Women's Business Development with the New York State Department of Economic Development. 
She oversees the agency services and business development units. How important is that? <laughs> agency services manages the Article 15A reporting and compliance of state agencies while the business development unit provides resources and guidance to MWBEs with the goal of accelerating their success in New York State government contracting. And over the past 20 years, she has served in strategic leadership positions in the realms of New York City, New York State, and federal government. As a project manager, a senior project manager, and head of community engagement for NYCHA, a $3 billion FEMA grant, Dawn brought her team to 70% participation by disadvantaged groups and positively impacted the entire grant to meet the new 30% guidelines set forth in 2014 by the governor. Ms. Sanders has honed an expertise for business analysis and change management for funding and delivering IT solutions and revamping business processes for enhanced customer service. She also has a unique background of working in leadership within the state legislature at a time when MWBE laws were being revived and strengthened. Finally, as an award-winning business owner for over a decade, she brings an uncom uncommon empathy to advocating for MWBE businesses. She received her bachelor's degree from Yale University, her MBA at the Columbia Graduate School of Business, and she's going to give you her email address after her closing remarks. <laughs> Dawn, can you please come up? Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm so glad that our panelists remained, because with the panelists and with Tracy, who I want to shout out, and Kim, who I want to shout out, that's at least 140 years of expertise and excellence. Kim only gave 10 of those years. She was, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it really does make a difference to have the right people in the room, to have leaders in the room, to have leaders who are not afraid. Um, so I'm joined here um, with by the state's director for agency services, Bobby Akuma. He will be here for a little bit so we can speak to a lot of the agencies. Um, I am proud to speak on behalf of Jason Miles Clark, who is the new EVP at, our, um, at ESD for MWBE programs. He is in Buffalo right now, holding the Buffalo Bills accountable for the largest project in state history. So we apologize that he could not be here. He was very excited to do so. But as you can imagine, um, trying to manage the implementation of 15A for 97 state agencies and authorities, we, we get um, sometimes behind in our ability to, to come out. But that said, I, I, I did like want to shout out Zaneda and Kim and Tracy, Michael. Um, I've gone to several community board meetings at the Scholastic headquarters, so I know the leadership goes way back. Um, and also NIPA, our powerhouse partner. Um, they come to all of our events. Um, I want to shout out some of the agencies that I saw in Buffalo a few days ago. I just made it back from Buffalo last night, and I see faces that were out there coming to each one of our events all over the regions. So again, I um, am really excited about the best practices vibe. I hear people talking about best practices. Um, and I think I haven't really heard this and seen this kind of energy since um, the late 90s when we realized that Y2K rollover gave us a unique opportunity to get rid of mainframe and come and, and bring the technology into the, the new century. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of urgency. Um, I think Kim Hardy was just coming out of high school and we were at HPD together at that time. But um, it was a really transformational time. It was a time that the city made a huge leap forward. And I see that kind of energy in the air again. Um, I see the, the, that there's a transformative feeling in the air. Um, we're having the, we'll be seeing the reauthorization of 15A next year. Um, we're at the 35th year of the MWBE program uh, this year. This is the first time in almost a decade that the city and state are working together. The administrations are working together um, harmoniously. So there's a lot of room for best practices to be shared between those two administrations. 
Uh, the governor announced earlier this year an e-procurement system that will hopefully pull together all of our reporting and make it a lot easier for agencies to meet their procurement requirements. Uh, I am going to try to just uh, wrap up quickly, but I guess what I what I am trying to say is that you know we are here at this time, um, ready to go forward. We have the right team on board um, at ESD Hope Night and um, under the leadership of Governor Kathy Hochul, we are um, going to move forward. I just want to say, you know, we are sensitive to certification. Um, we are sensitive to the disparity within the disparity. We, um, we realize that we have a lot of work to do. And I just want you to know, whenever you don't see us, we are working very hard behind the scenes to make some of these goals a reality. So again, really glad to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us. And, uh, and uh, onward. Thanks. So and thank you so much for coming.